Namaste, respected viewers. So, um, it being the 10th of May, it's the anniversary of the Indian Mutiny, or as many prefer to call it, the first national war of independence. Um, so, it was on this day in 1857 that the um, mutiny erupted at Mirut uh, in India, a um, city not far from Delhi. So, what was the incident which, which sparked off this uh, conflagration. Well, we'll look, look at the immediate term cause, and that was the new, uh, was the new cartridges issued to the army of the um, East India Company. Uh, and um, these new, more efficient cartridges allowing soldiers to reload and fire their um, uh, muskets more, more often, uh, will fire them faster, or, well, reload faster. They had bits of paper and they were greased. And the rumour got about this was greased with either beef or pork or a combination of the two. And of course, um, touching such a grease to one's lips was abhorrent to a Muslim or a Hindu, depending on which beast was used to make this grease. Um, I don't know which animal it actually was from, but uh, the East India Company authorities tried to assure the sepoys that uh, it was not the, uh, not the um, grease of either a bovine or a porcine that was used. Um, but that didn't, that didn't, didn't uh, allay their fears. So these two animals, well, each one of them is, is um, offensive to uh, one of the two major religions of India for opposite reasons. So uh, Hindus will not, will not consume beef because it's too sacred, whereas Muslims will not partake of pork because it's too foul. Um, but in either case, it's a totem or it's a taboo. Um, so that some of the Indian soldiers have been said, well, you can simply tear it with your fingers rather than touch it to your lips. But that was still, was still touching it. Anyway, so some of them refused to do this and military discipline being what it was in 1857 were marched off and sentenced to some terms of imprisonment with hard labour. And some of these were valiant soldiers who served the East India Company manfully for many a long year. And they implored their officers to intercede on their behalf. Now, some of the British officers were deeply sympathetic to their men and they had a bond of loyalty to them and they assured them that they, they would intervene, they do, would do what they could to get these sentences reduced. So it's very foolish of the uh, authorities to railroad this one through. You could have dismissed them from the army or something like that, um, but um, not, not jailing them. Anyway, their comrades were sympathetic to them and they were broken out of jail and a mutiny began and the town was overrun, and many British soldiers or loyal Indians were killed. So that was that, and it spread like wildfire throughout North India. Well, not throughout, through much of North India. Didn't get into Bengal very much, didn't get into Punjab very much. So remember, when the East India Company was founded on New Year's Eve, 1600, the East India Company only controlled a minute proportion of India, just a few uh, ports on the coast, Surat, first of all, then purchasing land, sometimes conquering land. So uh, Rome wasn't built in a day. British India did not, did not come into being like that. Uh, it was through myriad stages it advanced and advanced for about 300 years. So by 1857, the majority of modern India was part of the East India Company's uh, domains. And remember, until 1858, it was the East India Company, not the British government as such, which controlled any of India, the UK government indirectly controlled it through these regulating acts since 1783. So Mangal Pandey was one of the first men involved in all this, and um, that's why it was a film titled Mangal Pandey. And a Pandey became a um, name to typify the mutineers, just like the First World War, Fritz was a German, or it was Johnny Canuck for the Canadians, or Johnny Rebel for the Confederates in the American South, or Tommy for any um, a British soldier, Tommy Atkins, things like that. So there was also a pandy bat. I don't know if he was ever hit with a pandy bat. If you read uh, a portrait of the artist as a young man by James Joyce, he mentions a pandy bat therein. It's an Indian surname. So some informers has tipped off the officers of the uh, Honorable East India Company's army that um, an insurrection was in the offing, but uh, not much was done about it. So these cartridges were the ostensible cause, but people, some say that was the occasion or not the real cause. The ulterior causes are more long term. So uh, in the 18th century, the East India Company had really just been about commerce, about profit and loss, not about ideology. 
civilizing mission came in somewhat in the late 18th century. Now, many Indians will recoil at the very mention of that. And of course, India has a very ancient civilization. At times, was much more civilized than the British Isles, more advanced, having made various scientific discoveries long before the British Isles. And Ireland and Great Britain, we've learned so much from India, from chess to mathematics. Uh, the list is as long as my arm. But obviously, by the 18th century, India had fallen behind uh, the British Isles, which was at the scientific cutting edge at the time. And obviously, Indians can be highly sophisticated and refined and humane and all the rest of it, just as British people can be barbarians down to this day. So uh, you might say that talk about bringing a civilization is ridiculous. A civilization is not all or nothing. It's not a, a, a yes or a no. There are levels of civilization can be, and one can be civilized in this regard, but not in that regard and so forth. Um, but um, from the late 18th century, the East India Company was beginning to view it as its mission to change Indian society. Not totally, not in terms of clothing, but uh, in other respects. Um, and the uh, Regulating Act insisted that um, Christian missionaries be allowed to evangelize in India. Up until this time, the East India Company had said no, and old India Han said that is a very um, moronic idea. And the unwisdom of this was po possibly demonstrated by um, the uh, Indian Mutiny. So um, there were many Indian princelings who ruled their fiefdoms under the uh, Indian uh, East, the East India Company. So we just use prince as a generic term. So India was a, a patchwork of uh, these princely states. The, the, the princes held various titles like Raja, Maharaja, Gaikwar, Shah, Khan, um, Nizam, I've forgotten. Some of them were specifically Hindu or Sikh, some of them were specifically Muslim, and so forth. So some of these states were tiny, several hundred hectares, some were enormous, the size of an average European country. Um, and so this Indian prince, he could rule uh, his um, domain as he saw fit, with it, and, and that was it, and just to cooperate with the British authorities if they wanted to build a railway or something like that, not to have foreign relations except via the British couldn't accept an ambassador from China, or indeed send an ambassador to the United States or something. The British were to handle that. He could have his own army to be allies of the British in any war. So that was that. Remember, the Mughal Empire still existed nominally up until 1857. The Mughal Empire had been gradually declining, um, had um, been uh, uh, breaking up, and provincial governors just not paying tribute and uh, carving out their own realm and... Uh, uh, army commanders again disobeying orders and making their own uh, statelet wherever. And um, the British, French, the Danes, the Portuguese and others had assisted this process but sometimes allying with these centrifugal forces against Delhi. Of course Delhi was being the capital of the Mughal Empire. Remember the Mughals, they were Muslims who'd arrived from what's now Afghanistan in the early 16th century and uh, ultimately they were Mongols, hence the day Mughal. So uh, a lot of Hindus did not like uh, their mastery. So um, anyway, the uh, East India Company said if an Indian princeling dies without a male heir, well, that comes to us. There was some land that was directly ruled and administered by the East India Company, not by any prince. So the East India Company was acquiring more direct land. There was a mix between direct and indirect control. Indirect is when an Indian prince is running the show. There was also the doctrine of lapse, if you don't have a male heir that comes to uh, the uh, East India Company, or if there's gross, uh, gross misrule, the East India Company um, asserted the right to depose tyrannical rulers. And uh, missionaries um, uh, preaching the gospel, that really rubbed up a lot of people up the wrong way. The, um, the uh, Crimean War had ended in 1856, that war against Russia, and word had got about that all but 100,000 Britishers had been killed, so defeating them very easy. So anyway, those uh, soldiers found it very uh, galling to have to touch what they thought was beef or pork. The Hindus thought they might be outcast, as in lose their caste. Remember, Hinduism divides people into four castes plus the scheduled castes. And so Kshatriya caste is in the warrior caste. They're the ones who uh, could be soldiers. They really didn't want to be demoted in this situation. Caste is very important to them. So... Um, some Britishers didn't appreciate the sensitivity of uh, such religious mores. Um, so I won't go into the military campaign too much. It's too lengthy to describe here. Uh, some people thought uh, that the Hindu-Muslim fraternity, as uh, evidenced by the um, Indian beauty, was a splendid example. 
and something that they would like to recreate in the 21st century. Of course, there have always been Muslims and, and, and Hindus in um, uh, South Asia who've got along very well indeed. Uh, and in modern India today, that's often the case. Um, but there are times when they've, they fought each other. It'd be too simplistic to say that they all hate each other or they ever all did hate each other. There'd be some people who be bigots in any religious group and some people who'd be very enlightened and tolerant. Um, so I remember one of my friends who's a British Indian having to write it, well, choosing to write a project on this. Was it, is it best understood as the first stirrings of the Indian independence movement and so on? So the Mughal emperor at the time was named Bahadur Shah, as in brave king, although um, he didn't really deserve that name. Um, and, but the, the word emperor just seemed ludicrous for him as he controlled little beyond Delhi, and though he's commonly called the king of Delhi, because it would appear to be vainglorious to call him Mughal emperor. So quickly some British garrisons at Kanpur and Lucknow were, were besieged, um, and uh, the mutineers invested them. I won't go into them, but the siege was lifted and then it was reimposed and so on. So there were numerous atrocities carried out, as in uh, uh, Indian Christians and uh, British civilians um, uh, massacred in huge numbers. And eventually, obviously, the uh, loyal Indians and the East India Company, they prevailed. So the multiracial forces, whites and Indians together, fighting against the uh, religious extremists um, and uh, rescuing these people who, who had been besieged. And um, it's true that the East India Company um, exacted vengeance on the mutineers and some people who were merely suspected of being mutineers were killed. And um, uh, even and some innocent people probably got killed, which is obviously disgraceful. Now, um, some people who were thought to be mutineers were tied to a cannon and then the cannon was fired, blowing this person up. So you might say, well, that's a ghastly thing to do. Now, the death penalty was not remotely controversial in 1857. There was some debate as to for what, what crimes one should be executed. Now, um, mutiny has often been a death penalty offence. Treason has often been a death penalty offence. You voluntarily took an oath of, of um, allegiance to obey orders, whether you like them or not, and you broke these in a very serious way. Most people at the time would say, yeah, should definitely be executed for that. Um, because not simply just broke them in terms of not uh, putting these cartridges, cartridges to your lips, but going against your comrades, killing your comrades. That really is treason. And what's the penalty in India today for waging war against India? It is death, even now. So it, it'd be churlish to complain about what was going on in 1857. Now, being blown from a cannon, you say, might say, what a horrid thing to do. The thing is, it, the death it was at least instantaneous for these people, and it was uh, such a spectacle that it would have a tremendous deterrent effect on others. And it's said that some um, Hindus believe it would deprive them of an afterlife. They could no longer be reincarnated. It's notable that the Sikhs were almost all um, pro-British. Um, they'd been defeated by the British only a few years earlier, but uh, they're mostly very anti-Muslim because they've been so viciously persecuted by the Mughal emperors beforehand, and the first few gurus of Sikhism all um, killed by the Mughal emperors in the most sadistic possible manner. Um, so they were very pro-British, and their support was um, perhaps the, the determinative factor uh, in the Indian mutiny being defeated. And the Gurkhas remained uh, loyal, and the king of Nepal, well, remember he'd been defeated in the 1812 Nepal War. You can see the Ochtaloni monument in Calcutta to that, although it's now been rededicated to the, the Shaheed monument or something like that. And uh, some of the mutineers fled to Nepal, but the king of Nepal suppressed them, and the Britishers thanked him by even returning some of the territory they'd taken off him. So Delhi was retaken, and the king of Delhi was captured. So as his sons, it looked like they might be rescued by mutineers, and they were summarily, summarily executed. I wonder if that was an unethical thing to do, um, because I'm not sure if they were mutineers or not. So um, obviously our ethical standards are not the ethical standards they had back then. And I admit there was wrongdoing by uh, the East India Company army, that's by, by British men and perhaps some of the um, loyal Indians, as in um, stealing uh, money from civilians when these sort of things happened. So it's noticeable that the, um, the East India Company's army often defeated forces considerably larger than themselves. They didn't have much of an advantage in terms of uh, railways, hardly any railways had built or indeed telegrams to communicate. It's a very new thing. The, the um, Governor General of India at the time was Lord Canning, as in of the Prime Minister, George Canning, and he had to try and manage the situation from Kolkata, where there was no mutiny. So it's quite localised. We mustn't exaggerate the extent of this. Of all the East India Company soldiers, only about a quarter mutinied. Um, so um, what was the reaction? So there was ire 
in the British Isles and saying we must have more Christianity, not less, and there's something wrong with their religion. But uh, obviously very little was done to, to disseminate the Christian faith after that, which is why only about 2% of Indians are Christians. Half of those were converted by the Portuguese, not Britishers. So that's why uh, the British authorities learned to tread very carefully on religious issues thereafter. And even today, why in the Indian authorities are, are cherry about sending police officers or soldiers into places of worship in an official capacity, not in uniform. Operation Blue Star would be one of the few exceptions to that, that for saying that places of worship must provide for their own security. And uh, the police um, are very reluctant to go in there. So um, uh, Queen Victoria was the monarch at the time, and she said after this, we must open all positions to Indians because uh, Indians have been disbarred from, from senior officers until this time. And in the Victoria Memorial in Kolkata, if uh, memory serves me right, and I've not been there for 20 years, there was some statement that she made, which is etched in stone there. So the Honorable East India Company was dissolved the following year. And um, India was um, directly out of the control of the British government. There was the India office in London, and uh, there have been um, governors general sent out for some time, or they're often known as viceroys, and a viceroy's wife is, of course, the vice reign. Roy, as in from roi, or king in French, ruling in behalf of the monarch. So um, that was that. Um, so Bahadur Shah was not put to death. He was uh, exiled, and he spent the rest of his time writing mournful poesy in Urdu. He was sent to some islands. I can't remember whether it's the Maldives or where. So some people thought that British, the British had said were more responsible, the Muslims were more responsible than the Hindus for this. I'm not sure that's true. I know Bahadur Shah was a Muslim, obviously, and were then um, disfavoured in relation to the Hindus in um, preferment for public offices. Though Aligarh Muslim University was founded some time after this. So that's that. And the British Raj continued to expand into what's now Pakistan. And there were still wars against the Afghans. Um, so Sikhs were recruited in great numbers to the British Army, well, long perceived as one of the martial races. And of course, they'd always had to be willing to fight because they would obviously be in a great danger of being annihilated by the Mughal emperors in the 16th century if they hadn't, which is why carrying a sword was a um, key part of their faith. These days it can be a sim sim something symbolic, simply a piece of metal on a comb. So um, mutinies were not uncommon prior to that in the Indian, Indian Army, in the British Army, in the Royal Navy but often over pay conditions, rations, unpopular officers, things like that. So it would be unwise to attribute too much of a political motivation to this. Yes, it was there, maybe not for everyone. Um, and people who'd uh, unquestioningly uh, served, the, served the Raj for some time suddenly felt this was unacceptable. Um, to what extent was it um, religious in actuation to do with this one policy of... Um, uh, of the cartridges and others would say no the, the cause is much deeper than that it really is nationalism well it's, it's such an it's an imponderable it's far too big a topic to be to be undertaken in um, this brief video so the golden jubilee of this uh, mutiny was marked in 1907 by some Indian nationalists and some of them wrote poetry even in English hailing the uh, fallen heroes of that mutiny there was a Rani of Lakshmi um, so Rani of Jansi sorry this uh, woman, as in queen, uh, who led her soldiers into battle on horseback and indeed was killed in combat, one of the few senior commanders to, to be killed in combat. Sardar Vallabhai Patel, the first home minister of India, his father being involved in this, if memory serves, and um, Patel, he grew up um, on stories of the, of the India mutiny. So that was that. Obviously, only 90 years later, um, India became independent. Uh, it is scintillating to ask about the what if. Supposing it had succeeded, how would history have been different? Well, it would have been very different. Obviously, the British would have lost control of a lot of India, certainly North India, maybe the whole of India. And it was such a gigantic place, the subcontinent um, produced so much wealth, the UK would have been much diminished. Or would it have concentrated in other parts of the world that are actually easier to control? We know that India became independent in, 18, in sorry, 1947. Would in, would in fact the British Empire have lasted longer because the decolonization wouldn't have started so soon because obviously India became independent in 1947 and then decolonization took on uh, an impetus of its own and became unstoppable. Um, would some other European country have tried to come in there? Would India have remained united under the Mughal Empire? That's far from sure, far from clear. 
because central power was just so weak, it might have split up into uh, several countries or even more. Um, so we can't overemphasize unity at the time in India at that time or before. And unity isn't, isn't um, something which is um, binary. You have total unity, you have total disunity. There can be levels of unity. Um, and other, other European countries might have tried to conquer some other country or so on. Would India have developed faster economically? Indian nationalists would probably say yes, possibly not with the less access to technology. Um, anyway, so uh, the mutiny, um, it didn't come that close to succeeding because it would have been quite a, a high priority for the United Kingdom to win, rushing soldiers in, but they couldn't have been sent that fast. Remember, the Suez Canal hadn't been built, so it was going to take several months to sail from the United Kingdom to India. Uh, so there we are. It's an absolutely um, intriguing topic. Um, and I've been to, well, certainly in India, places where, sorry, particularly in Delhi, places which are relevant where some of the uh, key, 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 key battles were fought. There was La Martiniere School in, I think it's uh, Kanpur, Kanpur, I think I should pronounce it, named in honour of some of those who fought there. And Sir Henry Lawrence was one of those who fought there um, as well. And one of the senior commanders was at Havelock, was Irish as well, something that people prefer to overlook in Ireland as they tend to... Uh, uh, sympathise with the um, uh, Indian nationalist side, even though Irish nationalists don't appear to have seen their situation as being remotely analogous, analogous to that of Indians back then, partly because to some degree it was an anti-Christian uh, mutiny. So obviously I believe in freedom of expression. People ought to have the right to uh, spread their faith in any country in the world, whatever that faith is, Islam, Hinduism, Christianity, atheism, and so forth. So... Um, Insofar as it was, it, was, it was trying to take away people's freedom of expression, that was obviously a um, bad thing. Uh, so there we are. I think um, modern India doesn't owe a great deal to the Indian mutiny, despite what some people prefer to believe.